from Des Moines, Iowa to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm Kevin Cirilli in for David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We start with the lead political story here in Iowa and across the country. The caucuses that were meant to shape to the Democratic presidential race, but leaving candidates now and voters hanging with no results. We're expecting news from the Iowa Democratic Party to come this hour, and we will bring you those headlines as we get them. But first, let's bring in Bloomberg's Bloomberg DC's bureau chief, Craig Gordon, for more. All right, Craig, wow, number one. And secondly, where are we right now in terms of finally getting those results? Well, as you say, uh, the Iowa Democratic Party is about to convene a conference call with the campaigns. They did a couple of these last night. Um, as of right now, we don't expect that call to reveal the results, although it's a very fluid situation. We're not entirely what we're going to hear. We do know that many of the campaigns, but most pr prominently Joe Biden's campaign, has really questioned the process and really challenged the Iowa Democratic Party to explain what's happening, what's the process for verification, and you know how it goes forward from here. So as the more time that goes on, as we inch closer, State of the Union tonight, tomorrow the acquittal in the Senate, then of course New Hampshire on Tuesday, Day. I'm struck by this. Will Iowa matter? Yeah, it's going to matter not as much as it used to, though. You're right. The news cycle is very unforgiving, especially this week, which I would argue is the most, the busiest 72 hours I've ever had in my career. Iowa caucuses, State of the Union, and the expected acquittal of the president. Winning Iowa matters. It matters in the Democratic race. It, it, Pete Buttigieg seemed to have a pretty good night. Bernie Sanders seemed to have a pretty good night. If that holds up, that is going to help them as they head on to New Hampshire. And they didn't get the headlines they wanted. The national papers, people waking up, people staying up late last night, they didn't get that moment that to, to declare someone a winner. That hurts them. And I'm, I'm struck by Biden campaign strategy. It would seem that this is a strategy to, to really go to a process argument to say, hey, wait a minute, we're not prepared for this for the long run, so meet us in New Hampshire. Look, I think when you're a, po a politician and you are losing, you start talking about the process. Um, <laughs> if Joe Biden thought he was at the top of these results, he'd be uh, he'd be screaming at them to, to release them. Instead, he, there's a little bit of hand checking on what's the process, what's the count look like, etc. There's a, a widespread feeling Joe Biden did not do well last night, and I think that's what we're seeing in there. Coming up, we're going to talk about the policy of this, particularly cybersecurity, as well as the implications of politics for the president's State of the Union address. He's already tweeting about this, saying, "Hey, wait a minute, this is reflective not just of Iowa, but of a larger process for the Democrats." But I want to. You about the policy here in Iowa, ethanol. I mean, should they lose this caucus? Should Democrats pull out, even one party pull out? It's a significant policy and economic implications. Yeah, look, I mean, already the Iowa caucus was kind of hanging on by its uh, fingernails. <sighs> it is one of the whitest states in the union, a very small minority population here. The Democratic Party prides itself on being a party of diversity. A lot of uh, African American voters, Hispanic voters, they are in very short supply in Iowa. So Iowa was already under challenge from other states that think it shouldn't be first in line. Now, when you mess up the caucus, boy, it makes their argument for being back here in 2024, much harder to And make. it's brutal. And these Iowans take their job very seriously. Jean Hesburgh is also joining us here on set. She's the former executive director of the Iowa Democratic Party. Jean, what are your colleagues saying, your former colleagues saying in the past 12 hours? I'm sure they haven't slept a wink. Well, that's true. It has been very busy. And uh, not going to deny that this uh, process or, or the reporting results were not, uh, didn't turn out like we had hoped. Uh, but we have to separate two things here. One is how it was reported, and two is the caucus itself. Uh, I am never going to be the person that is going to sit in a chair and argue against the Iowa caucuses. Okay, and and the issue why? Why? Because yeah. it is the best process, uh, uh, the finest of democracy at work. Uh, Iowa has never argued that we're the most diverse state. That's the reason there are four early states. We have to look at the four early states as a package, all of which represent equal parts of the country. We have Iowa, we have New Hampshire, we have South Carolina, and we have Nevada, all representing great diversity across the country, all for reasons of building party. The caucuses and the early states are about building the party process and the Democratic Party equally in building the strength of the Democratic Party in parts of the country. This isn't about representation in Iowa. Right. This is about representation across the country. Gene, I was struck by this because Senator Joni Ernst, House, or Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley, two Republicans of the state of Iowa, as well as Governor Reynolds, right. another Republican, they released a statement this morning mm -hmm. and they said, hey, we got to keep this. Don't let this this mess up with the app with the app. Sure. Take away the first in the nation status. Absolutely. We do take our caucus very seriously. And one of the reasons the caucus is so beautiful is that it is an investment. This is people investing their time and their energy and their money. And their 
and their thoughts and their money. But their money, it's a, it's a big media thing. Absolutely. I'm talking about the, the, the volunteer effort and the people that actually go out and caucus. This is an investment, not just pulling a lever, but we all have to remember that the caucuses are about a party building toward November. For us, this is about beating Trump in November. So we're trying to build up the Democratic Party. And again, in the four early states representing the West, the Midwest, and the South, and the East Coast. All of these exercises are about November and beating the Republicans in November. Craig, let me bring you in here because you, you hear from Democrats how important it is for them to win back the, the, the Midwest part of the country, states neighboring here, states like Iowa, which the president carried by 10 percentage points last cycle. The president's going to talk to the country tonight. And this is the lasting political story now of the last 24 hours in America's consciousness. Does this change at all what the president has to say tonight? Uh, I'm sure he'll mention it. I'm sure he'll <laughs> talk about it. And I'm sure he'll take a he'll crow about it a little bit. Look, we, uh, there's a story right now out on the Bloomberg Terminal that some people in the market, in the Wall Street sort of uh, part of it, think what happened last night actually helps Donald Trump quite a lot because the Democrats definitely look like sorry to say, the gang that can't shoot straight. I mean, they can't even run their own election. It's the Iowa Democratic Party that runs this election, and they messed it up, plain and simple. So, But and respectfully, I mean, to, to defend Gene Hesburgh here, the former executive director of the Iowa Democratic Party, and not to go against you, boss, but this could have happened anywhere. I mean, this happened, and, and cybersecurity is so crucial. So, But, but conversations are going to have to be had here, Gene. Absolutely. Absolutely, conversations are going to be had. We have to go back historically. Since 2004, the Iowa Democratic Party has been asked for more information, exponentially more information, in every election cycle since 2004, even faster. And each time we have delivered that, more information and faster for whatever monster we need to feed for that information faster. And we have delivered. Where we haven't delivered how we wanted to, we have looked at our past mistakes and improved upon those. I have no doubt we're going to do an examination of what went wrong, and we will improve upon that. We have historically improved upon that. Iowa still is the best place because we know how to do this. So you were in that boiler room on the night of 2004, you said before we came I was on. in the boiler room last night. Last yes. night as well. Mm -hmm. Give us a scene then there when uh, when this started to go. Well, I can tell you, I ran a caucus last night. I ran a satellite caucus last night, and my caucus went beautifully. And it was a satellite caucus at a senior living facility, and those people would not have otherwise been able to caucus. But okay, who, who is in charge of this app? I. I don't know that. Who, why don't people know that? Shouldn't people not, you, but shouldn't your colleagues know that? Shouldn't, shouldn't people know who the app was? I mean, was it just tested for the first time last night? I can't answer that yeah. either. I can only imagine, my guess is it was tested, it was stress tested. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's what happens. I know that, that uh, and I would wager that the Iowa Democratic Party stress tested the app as well. So what and, do you think they are doing right now? Troy Price, the chairman of the Iowa Democratic Party, came and visited us here at Bloomberg. Uh, what are they, like, right this minute, what do you think they're doing? Well, I think what we're doing right now is what we did last night, which was in taking calls uh, from the precinct uh, uh, chairs and getting the correct data, which is what we want, yes. accurate data. And that's what I did when I went in after my satellite caucus and I helped the party and I and took calls and made sure and we're, we're getting the accurate results by hand and getting pictures of the math caucus sheets and that's what we're focusing on is getting the accurate results. And I just say to folks, I mean, this happened in Iowa, it could happen anywhere and it's so important and we're going to talk about the cybersecurity implications nationwide, worldwide for these elections now is a conversation that has been injected into the American consciousness. Gene Hesburgh, former executive director of the Iowa Democratic Party, I very much appreciate your time to come and walk through this and of course to Craig Gordon, the DC bureau chief here in Iowa. I know you've had a busy morning so thank you. Thanks. as well. And now uh, let's get a check of the markets from Abigail Doolittle in New York. Thanks, Kevin. Really a risk on tone on this Tuesday. Take a look at the major averages along with the Sox here in the U.S. We have the S&P 500 up 1.7 percent. The Sox really outpacing those gains up 3.1 percent. These are the best days that we've had for these U.S. indexes uh, since last year for the S&P 500 since last August. Really pretty incredible bounce back from last week, which was the worst week for the S&P 500 uh, since August. So a little bit of a reshifting of views around the coronavirus and what it could mean.
mean for the global economy. Speaking of the global economy, the emerging market index is also bouncing back up 2.5%. Net net, though, since the fears around the coronavirus uh, really came out about two weeks ago, all of these averages are down. But on the day, confirming the risk on mood of investors, take a look at the 10 year yield up for a second day in a row. Today, backing up by eight basis points over the last two days. Bonds pulling back the most since November of last year. Not pulling back, though, in any way whatsoever. Tesla. Let's take a look at a year to date chart of Tesla. This is extraordinary. Over the last uh, roughly uh, 25 trading days this year of 2020, more than a double, up 118%. There's a huge short interest on this stock. So probably some of those investors getting uh, burned by their idea that the stock would going down are getting out. That sends the stock higher. Will it last? The 2013 parabolic uptrend actually did last. So there is reason to think maybe this one will as well. Where we have another bounce back on the day, similar to equities. We have the commodity complex higher, not on the highs. Though. The Bloomberg Commodity Index earlier had been up more than 1%, now up just a quarter of a percent. Keep an eye on the commodity index uh, as and these commodities, oil, copper, copper having its first up day in 15 days because they are less liquid and they're more of a tell in the global economy and especially Chinese consumption. And then finally, Kevin, uh, breaking news not so long ago, we have the shares of Textron up 5.6 percent. There's a headline, Bombardier is in talks to sell its business jet unit to Textron. Uh, if that happens, it would help Bombardier perhaps have cash to help with their $9 billion uh, debt, which some investors see as too high. Textron clearly benefiting right now, Kevin. All right, thank you to Abigail. That Tesla story continues. Now with the first word news update in New York, here's Mark Crumpton. Mark? Kevin, thank you. The Iowa Democratic Party says delays in reporting the outcome of Monday's caucuses were due to a coding issue that has now been fixed. The party says it hopes to release results sometime today. Officials say they believe the party's reporting systems were secure and that there was not a cybersecurity intrusion. Candidates left Iowa Monday night for New Hampshire without the outcome of the contest being announced. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is slamming House Democrats' drive to impeach President Trump as, quote, the most rushed, least fair, and least thorough in history. The Kentucky Republican opened today's session by calling the two impeachment charges, quoting here, constitutionally incoherent. Leader McConnell has dodged questions about whether the president's actions pressuring Ukrainian leader Volodymyr Zelensky to announce an investigation in political rival Joe Biden were, appro were inappropriate. The president will pivot tonight from impeachment to his drive for re-election. He'll deliver the annual State of the Union address, the theme of his speech, the Great American Comeback. He'll speak before a joint session of Congress tomorrow. The Senate is expected to acquit him in the impeachment trial. For only the second time, a death from coronavirus has been reported outside mainland China. Cable television in Hong Kong says the victim was a 39-year-old man who had an underlying illness. China says the number of confirmed cases is now more than 20,000. At least 425 people have died. Macau is taking new steps to stem the spread of the virus. It's asking casino operators to shut down for a couple of weeks. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Kevin, back to you in Des Moines. Thank you, Mark. And coming up, we're going to take a look at technical difficulties faced last night and what it means for the coming primaries. Plus, tonight, tune in for our State of the Union coverage. David Weston kicks that off at 9 p.m. Eastern. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. I'm Kevin Cirilli. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Kevin Cirilli in Des Moines, Iowa. And the breakdown and reporting of Iowa caucus results last night has been tied to failures in a mobile app that may not have been ready for debut. For more on what that means for the future of the caucuses and the whole election in general is Jamil Jaffer. He is the founder of the National Security Institute at George Mason Law and a former senior advisor to the House Intelligence Committee. He comes to us from Washington. Thanks so much for your time and for joining us. All right, what, what went wrong last night and what can be done to fix it? Well, Kevin, it's a great question. We don't know a lot yet. What we know is that there was an app that the precinct uh, leaders uh, were given uh, to transmit their results back 
uh, up to the county level, then from the county to the state party. Um, and at some part of that process broke down. The results didn't get there. They were inconsistent, uh, as we were told by the state party late last night. Uh, and what they've done now is as of 3 a.m., they were sending staff out to every county. There are 99 counties in Iowa. I was out there in 2004 working the president's reelection campaign uh, for President Bush. And it's a lot, of, a lot of territory to cover, a lot of individual precincts to go to, collect those individual ballots and, and, and the cards and match them up against the totals they have because they want to be sure when they report these results, which are going to be very late, I, I'm not even sure we'll get them today, uh, that they're exactly accurate, having now had this sort of uh, problem with the app. Jamil, we talked earlier about the political ramifications, but just fundamentally, I mean, if you're outside of the, the Washington bubble, this is perplexing. This is confounding as to how this could happen. And, and it could really happen anywhere, could it not? Absolutely. I mean, look, the, most states have a pretty solid electoral system. Uh, they've, they've been using voting machines for a while. Um, you know, back in 2000, obviously, you remember the punch card challenges and the hanging chads and the like. So we all thought, OK, let's move to digital ballots. It's going to be a lot oh, easier, a lot better. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and now, you know, the challenge is, well, what about the cybersecurity challenges? What about these kind of technical challenges? The caucuses are something in the middle. They've been doing caucuses in Iowa since the 1800s. Uh, there's an old tradition of doing these things. Um, and, you know, they're using a new technology now, and it just didn't, for whatever reason, have the capacity or the capability to hold up, whether they didn't test it right or who knows what exactly went wrong. They're saying it wasn't a hack, but it does highlight the challenges with using technology in these spaces. And if you don't have paper backups, luckily they do here, um, what the challenges might be going forward, particularly as we think about potential election manipulation efforts uh, going forward by, you know, nation states. Now, we don't know that they're going to come after our actual election, our votes. They haven't done that yet, and we know that would be a huge issue. Um, but it's still something to be, to be thinking about and be getting ahead of as we look towards the November elections. You know, I think that's a really great point, Jamil, especially through the prism of how the intelligence community is working on with the political front. But it's really a patchwork across this country. Local elections are different from state elections, of course, from federal elections as well. Does that lead to confusion at the ballot box, not for voters, but for how to count these votes? Well, Kevin, I think the main issue here is how to get the states to work together with one another and to work better with the federal government to protect these votes uh, when the federal, when the big election comes up uh, in November. When that general election comes up, we know the Russians are targeting it. We've heard the Chinese might be looking to get involved. Also, other nation states. And so what we've got to do is, look, individual states run these elections as they always have, right? The problem is, is that individual states don't have the wherewithal, just like a single company doesn't have the wherewithal, to defend against a nation state attack. So what you've got to do is bring these states together in sharing alliances to share information about threats, to collaborate together on defense, and work with the federal government, Chris Krebs at DHS is leading on this issue, to really bring together a collective right. defense system to defend the nation when it comes to these elections. Jamil, I just want to read a headline crossing the Bloomberg terminal now. The Iowa Democratic Party to release most of the Iowa caucus results by 4 p.m. on Tuesday. So again, the Iowa Democratic Party to release most of the results in just about five hours from now. Uh, that according to, again, the Iowa Democratic Party, the headline crossing the terminal now. So they said this morning, Jamil, that they wanted to get these results out as quickly, as efficiently, and of course, as accurately as possible. I'm struck by this, though, because that's just a few hours when these results come out ahead of President Trump's State of the Union address. This is not the caucus that Iowa organizers had hoped for, is it? No, that's exactly right. They had obviously hoped to get the results out last night, like they have done traditionally, you know, for the last 30 years. And so, uh, you know, obviously it's a, it's a black eye for the party. They're, they're obviously very unhappy. They're going to try to get these out as fast as possible. But again, they want to be accurate because the last thing they want is questions within the party about who was the winner. What does that mean for New Hampshire? What does that mean for South Carolina coming up? It's still a very hotly contested uh, primary season for the Democrats. Um, and they're looking against a very tough uh, general election opponent in Donald Trump particularly coming off of what appears to be uh, a soon-to-be impeachment victory. So they really want to get this right, and so they ought not rush to it. If they can get them out and get them right by 4 o'clock, then that's fine. But I think you will see. You've already seen the Biden campaign putting a letter out late last night about the questions about, about these results. And so we'll see what's to come next if, in fact, as expected, Biden doesn't perform as well as they hope he might. Very quickly, Republicans should be watching this, too. I mean, if it could happen to Democrats, it could also happen to Republicans. Absolutely. I mean, I think, look, there's not a lot of competition right now in the Republican Party for the nomination, but certainly going forward in the next series of elections, uh, this is going to be a big issue. And whether it's uh, the presidential election in this prime in this caucus or the primaries in New Hampshire 
or down the road in the general or in later on primaries. The issue with uh, ensuring we have ballots and the elections are not only fair but are seen to be fair is a critically important issue. It was an issue in 2016. It's caused us all sorts of electoral challenges and discussions in our political system over the last three years. If we have these problems going forward, we're going to need to get them cleaned up. Otherwise, it's going to cause Washington and our government to come to stasis. And that may be good in some ways if you don't want the government regulating a lot, but it also can be bad if you need the government to do things that it can't do efficiently. All right, Jamil Jaffer, founder of the National Security Institute at George Mason University, and of course, the former senior advisor to the House Intelligence Committee. I, I really appreciate that perspective. And breaking news now, President Trump is weighing an exit to the World Trade Organization's $1.7 trillion pack for government contracts. That is according to a person familiar with the matter. More headlines as they come in. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Kevin Cirilli, and now it's time for the stock of the hour. Tesla is continuing its incredible surge. The stock is up about 15% today, adding on to yesterday's 20% gains. Kelly Lines has more. Kelly. Yeah, Kevin, the only way to really describe Tesla's move as of late is parabolic. The stock has already doubled so far in 2020. It's only been a month, and it has literally already doubled in valuation. Of course, a lot of this may be short covering. It was a very heavily shorted stock, but you also have continued optimism after its blowout quarterly report last week, as well as the opening of its factory in Shanghai. But really, there is a lot of momentum behind this. If you were to look at the relative strength index, the RSI, it's a momentum indicator. It tells us whether a stock is overbought or oversold, right? Right now, the Tesla is around 93 on the RSI. That is significantly overbought, even more overbought than Bitcoin was at the height of the bubble back at the end of 2017. Now, with the run-up we've seen, Tesla's market value is now above $160 billion. That is far greater then Ford and GM combined even has left Volkswagen in the dust. Actually, in terms of market valuation, it's only be behind Toyota in terms of the global automakers. But the thing I really want to focus on with that valuation is the fact that if you were to take the NASDAQ 100 as a guide, that index trades at a price to earning multiple of about 28 on average. If you were to apply that to Tesla, that would mean that at the current valuation, it would need to have a net profit of five and a half billion dollars, which frankly, Kevin, the company does not right now. Wow. All right. Up. Thank you, Kelly Lines. And up next, the number of countries bracing for the spread of the coronavirus is growing. The UK is now encouraging all British citizens to leave China as Macau shuts its casinos for half a month. This is Bloomberg Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Kevin Cirilli here in Des Moines, Iowa. But for Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton in New York. Mark? Kevin, the European Union is rejecting President Trump's proposal for securing peace in the Middle East. The EU is also expressing concern about Israel's plans to annex more Palestinian land. The bloc says it remains committed to a two-state solution. Mr. Trump's plan was welcomed by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, but Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas dismissed it as, quote, nonsense. Turkey says it doesn't want trouble with Russia. Speaking to reporters on his flight back from Ukraine today, President Recep Erdogan said there's no need for the two nations to engage in a confrontation. He added that Turkey has no plans to step back from its S-400 missile defense system purchase from Russia. Seven Turkish soldiers and one civilian were killed in a clash with Syrian forces in Idlib on Monday. Prosecutors say former PIMCO CEO Douglas Hodge should go to prison for his role in that college admission scam. They're asking for a two-year sentence. Hodge has admitted paying bribes of more than $625,000 to get his children into the University of Southern California and Georgetown University. He'll be sentenced on Friday. There are a number of developments in the coronavirus outbreak. A death has been reported in Hong Kong. That's only the second fatality outside mainland China. There, the death toll has risen to at least 425. And Beijing is reporting that there are more than 20,000 confirmed cases. The U.S. says it's preparing for a possible pandemic. 
Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Kevin, back to you in Des Moines. Thank you, Mark. And I want to stick with the coronavirus because joining us from Hong Kong with the latest on the global response to the outbreak is Yvonne Mann. All right. Thank you to thank you, Yvonne, for, for joining us. What what is the latest in terms of how officials are reacting over there to prevent this from spreading? Well, it seems like in the last 48 hours or so, we've seen Hong Kong at least uh, actually increase some of those travel restrictions. They've shut out all the three of those border checkpoints here in the city. But as Mark had mentioned, uh, the first reported death here in the city and marking the second death outside of China. But what we've learned from this case was this was a 39-year-old man who did have an underlying health condition. He had traveled to Wuhan and returned uh, back to Hong Kong and started showing symptoms. But reportedly, he while he was during that visit in Wuhan, he did not visit any wet markets. He did not visit a healthcare facility. So there are some concerns now here of this threat of of local transmissions, uh, which is something that we've been talking about for some time. And this, is, as we've been talking about, the death toll and the, the cases continue to, to shoot up. Uh, Mark had mentioned at least 425 deaths now, 20,000 infected cases with fresh cases out of Singapore and Thailand. And we see businesses as well shutdowns are piling up oh. with the likes of Macau saying then asking their casino operators to shut down for the next two weeks, which would be quite significant. They haven't done so since 2018 when there was that big typhoon and Cathay Pacific also cutting 90 percent of their flights to China, Kevin. Well, Yvonne, I mean, that's exactly where I want to pick this up, because my sources back in Washington, D.C. are saying that this is having a real impact on the U.S. and China trade relationship and other countries that are trading with China. No? Yeah, and, and you could say it's adding more strain to the U.S. and China relationship, given the U.S.'s response. They've banned entry of, of non-resident travelers uh, to uh, from China. Uh, so... That was significant, given the fact that the WHO uh, refrained from adding any travel restrictions on trade as well as travel. So in, in Beijing's eyes, this seems like at this point the U.S. is overreacting. They've accused the U.S. of, of spreading panic uh, in, in light of this, this issue. But it really hasn't just been the U.S. that's in, in, implemented these travel restrictions. We've seen it all across the globe as well, but certainly it has uh, in, in some way hurt uh, the trade negotiations moving forward in some way. It's definitely added a lot of volatility into the market, but it's also added in vol volatility in terms of how trade officials like Treasury Secretary Mnuchin are able to negotiate uh, with these officials. Dive into my terminal now because pull up this chart if you can. I mean, 20,642 confirmed cases and at least 425 deaths now uh, as a result of this particular outbreak. I mean, what what are they saying? I mean, you mentioned about how they're pushing back about how the U.S. is communicating about this virus and the corona out, coronavirus outbreak from a worldwide standpoint. But what are they actually doing to prevent this in China from spreading? Well, they've done some pretty drastic measures already. Of course, the lockdown in Wuhan that started in January 23rd, then that led to the, the lockdown in surrounding cities as well. So you're talking about 50 million plus people that are essentially being quarantined right now. And in Wuhan, that super fast hospital that they were building, that was built in 10 days and set to house about a thousand beds. So that's gonna help relieve some of the the the, 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 the medical workers and, and, and the staff right now trying to, to keep on and, and work throughout this crisis right now. So we've seen those measures. Uh, we also have been talking about how China in the last 24 hours or so uh, issuing a temporary ban on trading wildlife. This is not a permanent ban, mind you, but certainly this has been uh, a, a significant development here, given that this was the suspected kind of source of this disease was through these wildlife and wet markets. So we've seen some, some pretty big measures. And the WHO also talking about uh, perhaps, I guess, a little bit of, of good news here, saying that at this point, the virus has not caused a pandemic, although, as you mentioned, the U.S. is preparing for one. But they did say that they have not shown much mutation yet. And we have seen also cases, uh, yes, the numbers of, of, the, of, of infected cases continue to go 
up, but also the number of people that have recovered, that's in the hundreds too. I think the last time I checked, it's about 500 or so people that have recovered from this disease as well. So certainly there is some good news on that front. All right, Dave Arcasia host, uh, Yvonne Mann, thank you so much for, for getting us up to speed on that. Your reporting has been so incredibly important for this entire storyline. I'm anticipating that President Trump is going to address the coronavirus in his State of the Union address tonight. Now let's get a check on the markets from Abigail Doolittle in New York. Well, Kevin, we certainly have the bulls rushing back into stocks. This after last week's big slide on those coronavirus fears uh, and the coronavirus that you were just talking about with Yvonne Mann, the idea that it could really impact the global economy and growth along with the corporate U.S. the U.S. corporate profit outlook. But today and yesterday, investors want back in on stocks. Take a look at the S&P 500 up 1.7 percent. It's best day since August. We also have the Dow transports, which have slid more because of the airlines and the uh, the transportation aspect of that index and the fact that or the idea that it could be hit more uh, on a possible clampdown on world travel. The Sox chips also very sensitive to China through the supply chain and revenues bouncing back up 3 percent. All of this confirmed by the fact that investors don't want bonds for a second day in a row. Haven bonds selling off. However, since the start of the real news coming out around the coronavirus, it's a bit of a different story. When we hop into the Bloomberg, we have big declines for uh, the major averages here in the U.S., but really the Shanghai Composite, which is down about 9 percent over the last two weeks or so, headed to its worst quarter right now since December of 2018. That's true, too, for that Dow Transportation Index that I was saying was more sensitive to the coronavirus outbreak and the possibility that travel could really uh, be shut off to some degree on a global basis and hurt some of the stocks in that index, headed to its worst uh, quarter since December of 2018. The S&P 500 on today's big rally is bouncing back to some degree, but overall still down uh, since the coronavirus fears have erupted. Take a look at oil, because this has been another market to watch and track around the coronavirus. And oil had, at the highs today, been up 3 percent. This after a roughly 15 percent decline over the last two weeks, the bulls trying to keep oil higher right now bouncing back just a little bit more up one percent not so long ago up only about half a percent commodities very key uh, they're less liquid than stocks and also China is the world's largest user of natural resources so really a key tell on a market barometer uh, to the coronavirus and what it could mean for the economy and then finally Kevin getting away from the coronavirus and the market impacts some big movers here in the U.S. Tesla up in a huge way up 17 percent more than doubling this year a bit of a short squeeze as the bears most likely are getting out. We also have some other stocks which had been down more recently uh, related to that coronavirus, such as American Airlines, Wynn Resorts, and Marriott. But today, a nice bounce back right across the board. The Bulls in charge on this Tuesday, Kevin. The Bulls are in charge. All right, Abigail Doolittle, thanks so much for that update. And you can tune in for our special coverage of President Trump's State of the Union address. That kicks off at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And next week, be sure to tune into the coverage of the New Hampshire primary. We're headed to New Hampshire next. That kicks off at 8 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday, February 11th. I'm Kevin Cirilli. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Kevin Cirilli, and now joining me here to break down the latest headline as it relates to the Iowa caucus is Kathy Obradovich. She's the former political editor of the Des Moines Register. Kathy, headline crossing the Bloomberg terminal that says the Iowa Democratic Party has announced we're going to get those most of the results of the Iowa caucus in just over four hours. Four, four p.m. Hours. Central, five p.m. New York time. All right, so we're going to get results a couple of hours before the State of the Union. Yes, a couple hours before the State of the Union. Now, that is, that is rough. Uh, you know, <laughs> you and I live... You said it. <laughs> yeah, we live and breathe for these numbers. Um, and the fact is that the campaigns have already gone on to New Hampshire. This is really, really devastating for the Iowa Democratic Party and uh, for all of Iowa. Uh, I defend the caucuses every four years. Iowa fights for its first-in-the-nation status every four years. And I, I firmly believe that it should continue to fight, uh, but something's got to change. So uh, what, we, what should change? Well, so there's there, there are options, some of which Iowa wanted to try 
this year, but the DNC said no, the Democratic National Committee. One of those was to have uh, telephonic virtual caucuses where people could actually phone in, be absentee. It was mostly to address the accessibility issues where not everybody can get to a caucus. They address that partially by having these satellite caucuses. But that's, you know, the reporting issue might have been a little bit easier with people phoning in and making their selections on their phones. DNC said, uh, no, we're worried that could be hacked. Uh, the Democrats could go toward right. what the Republicans do, which is to just have a simple little straw poll at their caucuses. But That's quick and easy. But see, you know, I, I hear this and I, I'm just, I'm putting myself outside of our political bubble and and it, it's just, it almost doesn't make sense that they that that a process is this complex. That voting for who you want to be the nominee of your party is this complex, and this unsecure. And this really, I know, rightfully so, the Iowa Democratic Party is getting a lot of questions, put to put it mildly. But this really could have happened to any local community, to any state. No. Well, so first of all, I don't think there's been any evidence that the process was not secure. Um, they're talking about uh, a, a glitch in their reporting app. They're saying the data is good, it's the reporting that was a problem. So, uh, so I don't think there's any real question at this stage that there was some sort of security breach. Um, so I didn't mean to suggest yeah. as much in terms yes. of, but in terms of, in terms of the viability. But I hear you continue. Yes, but. Um, but the process is complex. This process was never designed for today's instant media, instant information media environment. This is a, a slow process. It, you meet with your neighbors, you talk right. it over. It's supposed to take a couple of hours. And, and the reporting really is secondary. All right, so that's the politics. Let's talk to policy because this is a major economic boom for the state of Iowa. And, and from an economic standpoint, to lose the person in the nation status would be, would, there would be a significant economic It's hit. not about the money. It's well, not about the money. Uh, what it's about, though, is the influence of Iowa. The money is nice, you know, but there are there are a lot of costs. All right, let's talk about let's caucus. talk about the the influence ethanol industry. Yeah, I mean, for this is a, this is an opportunity for the ethanol industry to really talk to these candidates. Yeah, it's more than about special interest, though. It's about having the person who's in the White House know Iowa, understand the state, no people here. Yes, no people here, and you know, when when they have policies that come come down the pike that hurt Iowa, hurt Iowans, uh, they're more likely to, the White House is more likely to listen to what Iowans have to say. It's about access, it's about influence, it, money is a side issue. Well, no, but farmers, agriculture, USMCA trade deal, US-China, we're talking about the impacts of that on this program. I mean, yes, this, yes. Should, should Democrats or any one particular candidate or party avoid Iowa, what is what would that say uh, about that party or that campaign's uh, notion of, of the importance of, of states like Iowa? One of the arguments for states like Iowa is that candidates have to learn about these issues in the heartland. They can't just campaign on the coast. They can't just campaign by buying uh, millions and millions of dollars worth of ads. Uh, they have to get to know the people. They have to hone their issues, to talk to regular people on the ground. Uh, they have to be able to answer questions from regular people, not just the media. Uh, and those types of skills translate to other states. Uh, they learn it here. Um, because the process is low, uh, slow, and grassroots oriented, and then they can take those skills to other states. You mentioned that, and, and, and I do want to get your point, your uh, pick on this, because we were just talking before you came on air about how we interacted four years ago. I feel like every four years you see someone you met in Iowa yes. in the caucus before. <laughs> That's so and fun. I, I it is. It's a blast from the past. I remember the last cycle, just how anticipated that Des Moines Register poll was. Oh. I know. Oh, it's I'm a sorry. stab in the heart. I know, man. but 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 it's it's this illustration of how funky, for lack of a better word, this caucus was, because that Des Moines Register uh, poll never came out. What happened? Yeah, so there's a theme that runs through here, Kevin. Uh, the Des Moines Register poll, uh, there was a glitch. They didn't feel like they could be confident in the numbers. They chose integrity over putting out something that they knew was eagerly anticipated. The Democratic Party, uh, everybody's waiting for the numbers. They're choosing integrity and trying to make sure that they get it right over satisfying the need to get that information out sooner. So uh, I, in both cases, I think that the party and the Des Moines Register made the right decision, but they're incredibly, incredibly painful decisions. Uh, at the Register, there was just a, there was 
a minor glitch at a call center and they could not stand behind the numbers. You know, I, I was struck by this. I was talking about it earlier on the program with Craig Gordon. I know you're going to stick around for radio as well. Uh, but we were talking about just this 72 hours in American politics, caucus debacle, okay, State of the Union, and then the acquittal tomorrow. Have yes. you ever covered anything no, like this? No, no, never, never. It's been, uh, you know, this has been a momentous year already, and it's barely February uh, with the the impeachment, uh, the caucuses, everything that's going on. And uh, my organization that I write for is only five weeks old. So, so What's we're, your organization? That's, yeah, Iowa Capital Dispatch. So Iowa Capital Dispatch. All right, yes. you're going to stick around for me with Bloomberg Radio, and we're going to have complete coverage of the Iowa caucus results later this afternoon as we get them, and of course, the state of the Union. I'm Kevin Cirilli. Thanks for watching Bloomberg Television and Radio. More next. From Des Moines, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Kevin Cirilli, and President Trump is set to deliver his third State of the Union address to a divided Congress amid a fast-approaching general election and a looming impeachment trial vote in the Senate expected tomorrow. For now, we're joined for more by Greg Soar, Bloomberg Supreme Court reporter from Washington. I I'm really struck by the pageantry every year of the State of the Union, Greg. And John Roberts, Chief Justice John Roberts, in that chamber, just ahead of this acquittal vote tomorrow is going to be historic. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, we've been watching him for the past several weeks, you know, high above the, the Senate, uh, overseeing the trial. Now he'll just be an audience member. Uh, he will, uh, you know, shake hands with people. He'll, he'll uh, be polite and he will try to show, much as he did uh, in the impeachment trial, almost no expression throughout the speech. And, and meanwhile, beyond all of that, the politics of this coming, of course, here in Iowa, where they're, where they're going to be doing, uh, where they're releasing just a few short hours from before the start of the State of the Union address, the results, most of the results of the caucus, and then the vote tomorrow. In terms of where this State of the Union address stacks up, Greg, with other State of the Union addresses for presidents who have gone through the impeachment process, how does it compare? Yeah, it, it's uh, certainly remarkable. Uh, Bill Clinton, of course, had to do something similar back in 1999 uh, with his impeachment trial going on here. Uh, of course, everybody is looking to see what sort of tone Donald Trump strikes. Will he be uh, combative? Will he, uh, you know, go after Democrats for uh, bringing up uh, the impeachment articles in the first place? Will he try to move forward? Um, and again, as you said, you're going to have the Supreme Court right there in the middle of it. Uh, the other branch of Congress that's not really involved in this political struggle, but has been drawn into it because of the impeachment trial and now uh, the State of the Union address. Greg Shore, he's of course our Bloomberg Supreme Court reporter. Greg, I, I, based upon my reporting and talking to sources at the White House and those advising the president on how he will communicate uh, his State of the Union address this evening, uh, I'm struck by two things. First and foremost is that he's going to be striking an optimistic tone. So from a rhetorical standpoint, he's going to be much more optimistic. But from a policy standpoint, he's got to really combine the political aspects of this and talk to the suburbs, does he not? What are you going to be looking for on a policy front? Uh, well, uh, you know, on a policy front, uh, you know, in, in some senses, the president is going to be, uh, it, you know, he's looking ahead to, to re-election. Uh, he is uh, starting to think about what is he going to be telling people why I should be re-elected. It can't just be, uh, you know, backwards looking, complaining about what Democrats ha have done. Uh, you know, he's going to want to uh, talk at some point about what he would do as president for the next four years. 
Yeah, and meanwhile, in terms of the Medicare for All, in terms of health care policies that we're hearing, the president's going to continue to raise the issue of the Affordable Care Act and repeal of it, but also as it relates to prescription drug pricing and the president's economic policies as it relates to tariffs and how he's negotiating. And again, I said this earlier, I'm also anticipating, Greg, that we're going to hear a little bit about the coronavirus based upon my reporting uh, and the president addressing that. Uh, but the stakes for this president on the even of impeachment, just quickly before I let you go. The stakes are incredibly high. Yeah, they're incredibly high. And of course, you also have a Democratic Party that is, is in a bit of disarray after the, the Iowa debacle last night and continuing into today, the, the, the caucus debacle. And of course, the failed uh, or the expected failure of the impeachment vote. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he will have an opportunity if he wants to, uh, to, uh, you know, do a bit of a victory lap. And, and, you know, this is a president that likes to do that sort of thing. All right, Bloomberg Supreme Court reporter Greg Storr, thank you for joining us. And, of course, breaking news now, headline crossing the Bloomberg terminal. Saudi Arabia's public investment fund sold almost all of its Tesla holdings in the fourth quarter. That's according to a filing obtained by Bloomberg. And coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. I'll be hosting from right here in Des Moines. Tomorrow I'm headed off to New Hampshire. And remember to tune in for our special coverage of President Trump's State of the Union address. That kicks off at 9 p.m. Eastern time. This is Balance of Power. I'm Kevin Cirilli on Bloomberg Television and Radio.